I want you to, and not that you need to be reminded of this, but speak freely, yeah, speak yeah. honestly. Of course. So you mean don't sugarcoat and never tell you all the lies? If there's oh. if there's a thing that you want to just get off your chest, but you want to say like off the record, right, right. feel free to say just off I don't, the record. I don't say anything off the record. Nothing's off the record, all right? <laughs> but you know, no, we can that's edit. Got, that's got me in trouble, right? Like because <laughs> it's on because it ends up being on the record. Yeah, because it. People get in their feelings, and I'm like, what I'm supposed to do is lie. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? If you can um, do not disturb your phone. Just for the audience who can't see right now, you're taking off all the AP and all the gold right now off your wrist. I'm trying to get comfortable. Because, like, it's too heavy, right? I'm just trying to get comfortable. (laughs) The AP is just weighing you down. I'm just trying to get comfortable so we can speak freely. From Hype Beast Radio, I'm Jeff Staple, and this is The Business of Hype, a show about creative entrepreneurs, brand builders, innovators, and the realities behind the dreams they've built. Michael Camargo, better known to y'all as Upscale Vandal, represents to me the new generation of today's entrepreneurs. Those individuals you see dominating social media, but you don't exactly know what they do. But you know they're successful and that they have a firm grasp on their skill. You just don't really know what their skill is. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't some Paris Hilton shit where you're just famous for being famous. Nah, these people work, but the work is so new, so blended and so organic that it's difficult to differentiate what work is and what just their life is. Have you heard about the slash generation? It's a term coined for people with an uncommon combination of job titles that they often prefer to take on versus just one traditional one. So if you have a friend that is a DJ slash stylist slash curator slash chef, then you know what I'm talking about. Upscale personifies this slash generation, and Mike has a mile-long resume of experiences. So let's dive into this episode. I want to make sure that everything I do is made for a younger version of myself. Mm-hmm. You know, right. and, and I could have made a ton of mistakes and stuff. Like, yeah, and up, yeah. no, made and still like you know, I mean, you, you know my background pretty well. Like I, I went through it, man, and like it's just now past. Five years has been a blink of an eye, but like I've really gotten all my hits off in five years, yeah. you know, and that's like, it's a blessing, but it's also like, it, it puts you in a whirlwind where you're not focusing on on making sure you're doing the right steps to leave a foundation for the kids who are coming after you. Mm-hmm. That's why I don't take interns, you why? know, because I don't want to teach somebody the wrong way to go about doing something. Uh-huh. And that's my way. It's the unconventional way. And it's hard for me to give you a blueprint that I'm making up as I go. Really? And if I lead you astray, I feel responsible. So I'd rather learn, make the mistake, and then show you and let you decide which way you want to go. So I'm not going to take anybody under the wing unless I know that they have the tools to make it like I had the tools to make it. If I failed, I knew I'd be okay because mm-hmm. I wasn't gonna lose in at all in the full regard. Like yeah. I'd probably take a small loss, yeah. but I'd be back. I feel you. And a lot of kids ain't like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I admit, you know, I have like over twenty five employees and stuff, and sometimes I do get a, a pang of guilt in me right. where I'm like. And the same was, for everyone. Like, and, and if you went anywhere else, it'd be so different for you. Meaning yeah. like those those guys, those kids. Yeah. It'd be, I, mean, I can't say if they'd be better or worse, but I'm, I almost sometimes I'd, feel I'd bad. I'd say they'd be worse. <laughs> I mean, knowing what you've done, you know, like, again, think about all the people that look up to everything you've built, right? And you're more public now. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because the, the ethos of what you've done for streetwear, for fashion, for sneakers... Um, kind of pushed you to do that, yeah. right? And and you're you know you're a family person. You, mm-hmm. you know that there's a responsibility that comes with your success. Um, but I've I've noticed it because if I would have known everything you've put out there seven years ago, yeah, eight years ago, you're still laying the blueprint. So I know that the kids that work for you are probably like again, you guys are like, man, we just did this project, we broke this door down, mm-hmm. and we were a part of it now. You know what I mean? But right. they've seen you do that from afar, yeah, and not know how the fuck it happened, right? right? right. So it's like. How do you send them off into the world with this, like, you know, with this, with this knowledge? And then they're like, wait, how do I apply it to this new thing? And they're yeah. like, yeah, there is no Jeff Staple here for us. <laughs> right? Like, if they right. go to work at X com- company X. He's not like, like, there, yeah. Wait, there's no, there's, there's no <laughs> Jeff. Wait, we can't do this. Right. Good. I'm going to make sure all my employees hear that. They know. They know. Uh, all right. Everyone out there who works for me, did you all hear that? You might want to rewind and listen again. No, I kid. So like I said earlier, Mike represents this new generation that is very hard to describe. 
I often hear these people call themselves an artist or a creative director. There's a great meme out there with Oprah Winfrey passionately pointing to people in the audience. You're a creative director. You're a creative director. You're a creative director. There isn't really a catch-all phrase that easily describes what all these people can do. So in speaking with Mike, I definitely want to know how he describes his own profession. So you obviously have, uh, you know, I think it's you have a mastery of fashion. Right? Thank you. In, in a certain way where like... I think it's also very difficult to succinctly say what it is that you do. Yeah. Like if someone, if you're like on an airplane and someone's like, hey, w- what do you do? Uh-huh. How do you answer that question? Yeah. In a short way without sounding like obnoxious because it happens to me often. I always have to like take a second back and listen to myself to say what I, I don't want to say too much. <laughs> um, but I'm a consultant. Um, you know, I started off in the business of fashion and sales. I was a sales manager for a bunch of brands. Um, and I built a bunch of brands. And... When I was in sales, you know, people who go to school and take the conventional route kind of once they once they're in a position of like that they're comfortable in and that they're succeeding in, they're like, okay, this is great. I finally doing what I love to do. I'm gonna do this. Me, I'm like, wait, but why didn't why doesn't this work this way? And why mm-hmm. how come I have to go through all these loops? So then I started learning all the things around it, the marketing yeah. aspect, the digital portion, things yeah. that I didn't have help as a sales rep. Right. To do. And I feel like you learn not by reading a book and going Hell to school. No. You you the kid you the kid that learns that the kettle's hot by touching it. Man, and then I touch <laughs> it again and then I touched it again and then I thought maybe using a um oven mitt, but then right. I got but, burned again and you know, but I I wouldn't trade that, you know. Yeah. And I think that um, you know, using using that same metaphor, putting my, my hand to the fire is the best way was the best way for me to learn because of the extremities mm-hmm. that I came from. Yeah. Right? So I had to go a further way, right? right. And the fur- the furthest way to go is to lead by example and show like I'm not scared to get burned doing this. Yeah. There's a lot more companies that are willing to put you in front of the firing range. Right. You know what I'm saying? They're like this dude can handle the burn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 um you know that's what ended up happening, man. Like I'd go and I'd work I'd work with these companies, you know, and I'd be like, "Wow." These kids are really, really slow. Like mm-hmm. they have no hustle in them. Yeah, you were given this position because you went to school and then you went this and you entered. You worked at nine places that uh-huh. gave you enough resume to muster up a little interview at this place, and they finally let you in. And you're just gonna keep your head down and do this. And yeah. like where I come from, like that's crazy to me, mm-hmm. you know. And it, you, you the same, yeah. right? Like you were like, okay, I'm sure, like you know. And it, I often think about this when I build new things out. And I've taken your example plenty of times and other people who I respect, like Aaron Levitt, you know, or, or, or uh, Noah, mm-hmm. Noah Callahan, right? I say, what, what would have, like, Jeff done here? Because I know there was a time where you faced adversity, like, you know, you're a minority, mm-hmm. right? Like, you're a minority. Like, I think that people, and I think that in the fashion and streetwear culture, like, the blurred lines of, of race, yeah. like, play a factor into business, but we they don't understand what you've had to deal with mm-hmm. once you have to go to a corporate level. Yeah. Right? You're exactly. still an Asian kid from yeah. wherever you're from. Yeah. And it's like... I'm you, a minority everywhere I go. Right. Like, so you have to realize that, like, yeah, you may not deal with the same level in things of racism, but you had your own hurdles. So when you go into these corporate offices, you're like, man, I'm going to eat these guys alive, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. they didn't have to do anything that I had to do. And I often put myself in that mind state. So that's what, that's what ended up happening. Like, I started learning every position. Uh-huh. Like, I was a shooting guard, but... I was like, man, I can probably post up, right. you know what I mean? And I could probably defend the, the paint. And I just started doing that. And um, the more the more things I got under my belt, mm-hmm. um, the more I kind of built uh, a niche company, which is the Upscale Vander Group, which is what we do is we kind of, the, the, easiest, the easiest one sentence is like, we can get you hot. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's an album rollout or if it's a clothing line or if it's... Um, uh, a, a beverage, yeah. you know. I've worked with PepsiCo. I've worked with Google. I've worked with. I've worked with a lot of companies in right. the past four years, three years, and our entire purpose is to get you hot mm-hmm. in the demographic that you want to be hot in, yeah. organically, right? And not not by attaching my personal social media to it. I do that if I organically believe in a product mm-hmm. that I'm that I'm working with. But there's plenty of clients that have hit that you never know I worked on, yeah, and will never know because right. that's the part. That's the the part about being a good consultant is you're not supposed to see the hand. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're not supposed to see the puppet strings. Yep. Um, and that's what I do. You know, I'm a consultant of all. I mean, the company does lifestyle marketing and brand development, mm-hmm. but I'm a consultant in in all regards. Yeah. So before sales, you were also into styling, right? Yeah, that was my first gig ever. Okay. Um, it was my entry into the business. Um, 
it's funny hearing myself say this because I just did a, a podcast with It's The Real. You know uh-huh. those guys? Jeff? No. Uh, they're, they're like hip-hop. They're two Jewish kids who like grew up on hip-hop. Okay. And they do sketch comedy hip-hop. Oh, okay. It's great. And they have a really good podcast um, um, that Hypebee should actually look at. Incorporating <laughs> because um, they have such a wealth of knowledge of hip-hop. And yeah. from their perspective, it's different, right? Yeah, yeah. They're like Upper West Side Jewish kids. Um, and I did it with them and they were asking me similar questions, but faced on the music face of it right mm-hmm. we're talking in the fashion sense of it so it's like funny seeing myself in yeah. the dichotomy of those two right but um you know uh when i started styling it was because i thought like and you know this is to be very you know non-vulgar and non-heavy but like when you're a kid from where i come from which is you, where i'm from ozone park which is an area that's right on the, literally the bordering avenue of uh East New York, Brooklyn, and Jamaica, Queens. Mm-hmm. So it's a beautiful place because you get such a meld. Like, I grew up on, like, right on the Brooklyn side. Yeah. So, like, you get such a meld of what's going on because, like, I grew up in between the one of the worst housing projects in New York City. Like, right in between, meaning borderline-wise, and then the mob. Mm-hmm. John Gotti. John Gotti's from seven minutes from my house. Yeah. You know? And then, like... The hood, yeah. Yeah, then Tut and, like, all those guys you heard about, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. All, you know, these street legends yeah. were from right there, too. So, like, that dichotomy of crime makes a very different type of environment to grow so up So, how was, like, young Upscale Vandal? Like, what was it? I'm exactly the same. Yeah? I'm dead serious. But and and just, I hear it all the time. You like, must have been just seeing, like, Yeah, I mean, well, I, shit. Everything, everything came from my sister. Uh-huh. You know, my sister was in the streets running around, just being a kid at the in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. So imagine being, you know, you know what it was like. Yeah. You know, it was being a kid in the early 90s in New York City mm-hmm. gave you literally an encyclopedia version of knowledge of the culture. Yeah. And when I say the culture, I don't mean like the kids say, yeah, keep it for the <laughs> culture. I mean, like the culture, everything is built on. I'm talking about low lives, rap. Yeah. All the first like... You know, her her best friend Leroy gave me Reasonable Doubt on a tape. Mm-hmm. You know, like all those things happened in real time yeah. for me. Um, real mixtapes out of a trunk of a car. Like. Yeah, <laughs> all those things happened in real time for me. So yeah. seeing that is where my everything that I come that I represent now comes from. So it's like I've been the exact same person forever. Uh-huh. My barber, he's been cutting me. Shout to Fran, Matt Cuss Barbershop on Four Bell. Um, he's been cutting me since I was 14, 13 going on 14. Yeah. And um, you still live in Ozone Park? Yeah, I, I bought the house. Me and my sister bought the house we grew up in. Wow, that's yeah, dope. Yeah, yeah, I still live on the same block. Um, but you know, uh, he he was on my live stream the other day, and like you know, he knows about what I do and you know whatever. And he's like, "Man, it's crazy seeing you be the same exact kid mm-hmm. from when you were fourteen to now. Like you're the same person. You preach the same things. You <laughs> want the same things. You're yeah. all about your clothes. You're all about this like." That's you've never changed. Do you ever feel like you've never changed, but the world caught up to you? Mm, no, actually. Then what's changed? I, Why are you so successful now? But because I've been able, I feel like now I've been able to um, this the ideas and the synergies I've had. I've been able to actually, I have the the blessing to put them into play now, mm-hmm. right? Like before, if I had an idea when I was in the street, like yo, imagine if Nike did da 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 da. Yeah. Now I can call somebody and say, hey, you guys mm. should do this, mm. and if you don't want to do it with me, you should do it with these people. Well, here's the thing: you could have called them before; they just wouldn't have listened to you. Right. Why, I couldn't why? have called them before. Yeah, you because I was in the street. <laughs> you know, I was in the street. They weren't gonna listen to me. Like they weren't gonna know? listen to you is the key. Yeah. But now they're listening to you. Yeah. And well, you're the you know, same dude though. Yeah. Clark, like Clark, brought me around Nike for the yeah. first time. Uh, dude, shout out to Clark Kent, and like he would introduce me to reps, and they were like. This my man. You know, he calls me Charm. Why? So, it's so <laughs> funny. Mayor, you know Mayor, yeah, right? Mayor. Anybody that knows me from before used to call me Charm. That was like a street name. Okay. Right? It was like a street name. It was like, you know, my, my real name is Mike. And it's funny because it was like, depending on who, who a group of people you knew me from, you yeah. knew me from one thing. Like, you know, Chicago played a big part of me getting into the industry. Uh-huh. Like when I was a stylist, they introduced me to April Rumad and they introduced me to the industry a lot. Um my Chicago guys call me Brooklyn Mike because mm-hmm. I'm from Brooklyn and they would come and, and visit me and stay in Brooklyn. And yeah, yeah. So I was Brooklyn Mike to them. But to Clark and Mayor and everybody in New York, I was charmed. Okay. So, so like, when you, it's funny because when people tell Clark, yo, I was just with your man Vando, he's like, oh, charm, that's my man. Uh-huh. He won't, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. That's not him. He won't take I know him as charm. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. So, um, um, so pre, so he would take me to these people, you okay. know, or I'd be around yeah. and he'd be like, yo, this is such and such from Nike. And I'd be like, wow. And he, and he'd be like, who's this kid? He's wearing like 
you know, thirty thousand dollar necklace. He's driving a Charger with five televisions in it. It was wild, right? It was like who, he's not. He's he's probably like known in this, but he's a street kid. Yeah. So they weren't. They didn't care. You uh-huh. know, they didn't care about about me. Um, what were you now, doing before styling? Um, I was in the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like right before styling, I had just when I started styling, I just came home from fighting like a case, mm-hmm. and I was on probation, and I knew I had to change my life. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I did. I did some time. Yeah. I ended up, you know, uh, getting time served. I took a plea deal that gave me time served for all the time I was fighting my case in jail. Mm-hmm. And then I came home on five years aggressive probation. Um, and that's when my, my when I knew I didn't want to go back to jail. How long were you away for? Uh, all together, it was two jail years, so uh-huh. like 18, 19 months. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, had to, I had, when I got locked up, they didn't want to give us a bail hearing. <clears throat> so, you know, I fought for, I don't know, nine months. And then came home for a month, got remanded because they took our bail away and had to fight the rest of the case. And then, you know. Can you um, say what it was for? Uh, it was a drug conviction. Okay. Yeah, it was a um, conspiracy drug conviction, uh-huh. an A1 felony. Is that moving or using? No, never using. <laughs> nah, I've never used drugs in my life until June. Like, I started smoking weed in June. Like, <laughs> it's a new habit you picked up now? <laughs> yeah, like, it's funny because, like, oh you know, uh, everybody's like, man, what are you going to do when you get off probation? I got off probation in June. Uh-huh. For, you know, I, I've done everything I've done in my... That's another thing. Like, I've done everything in my career I've done off probation. That's why we, we're in Dubai right now. Yeah. I wasn't able to travel until June. Right. Uh, uh, overseas. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. It's crazy. So you knew after you went to jail, this is not a place I want to come back to. <laughs> yeah, it was just, you know, it was a lot. Like, you know, not to get too deep into it, but there was a lot in my case, you know, that stipulated a bunch of things. Like, my family was involved, and mm-hmm. it was a lot of things. And I was like, man, this isn't the way. Mm-hmm. You know, my father went to prison. My father got sentenced to 15 years, you know, and then got deported. And, you know, so I've been around that a lot. Yeah. You know, my friends, my uncles, my this, my that. Like, you know, death, yeah. murders, kidnappings all like seeing that from a distance as a kid like i'm colombian mm-hmm. so you know when i was growing up i grew up in the early 90s i was born in the late 80s so seeing what was going on in the news back home and like my parents and my mom and my uncles reacting to it like i remember when escobar got killed mm-hmm. and like we were in my my cousin my uncle carlos's house which is a block away and like it was all over the news and yeah. i was like man this is nuts and like i you know i remember this i don't remember so directly but i remember that being an energy around and you know, um, you know, my dad was in the game. My mom was in the game. So, oh, your mom and <clears throat> dad. Yeah, both my parents was in the game. Wow. Yeah, you know, my mother did federal time, and my father did federal time. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it's very difficult to escape that lifestyle? Absolutely. When you're up in it. At, uh, I don't. I wasn't brought up right, in it. I was sheltered. Yeah, I was around. sheltered. I was sheltered. But you know, once you get to a certain age, you see that energy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and my sister kept me away from all that because my sister's like a straight and arrow. My sister ran the streets just because, like, as a rebellious teen, but, like, she fixed her life up quick. Wow. Yeah, like, and I tri- I attribute all my success in- to her because she raised me. Mm-hmm. You know, she was the one that was like, look, that shit's whack. Don't wear this. Don't be here. Dumb dudes are corny. This is, like, my sister, my sister, the, the best thing always about my sister is, like, I always tell people, like, as much bawling, as much, like, flossing, as much whatever extravagant stuff her friends had, my sister was always the one with steady money, steady car, and her bills paid in her own spot. Yeah. All her friends were selling dope, doing robbery, doing whatever, uh-huh. and she was the only one with a steady income because she worked a straight and narrow job. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck that, right? Like, right. whatever. The only job I've ever had is that I, was, I worked at a call center. <laughs> so, like, you know what I'm saying? I went yeah. straight from that to this. On this show, I try and stay close to the topic at hand which is business. There's other places to hear the history and personal bios of people, but in Mike's case, his family, his upbringing, and his surrounding hood was his business. So I felt like I needed to make an exception here. He got his degree from the streets and his sister was the professor. And as you heard from Mike, a failure in this course didn't just mean an F. It would likely result in something far worse. I interviewed Sarah Andelman on a previous episode, the founder of Colette, And while Mike and Sarah could not have come from a more disparate background, they do share one thing in common. They've only had one job. And to me, that shows complete dedication to their craft. It doesn't matter where they come from, the passion is the same. Last time we we hung out in Vegas, we had a little discussion on on Jay's new album. Yeah, of course, man, wow. And we talked about 
a little bit about how like you know Jay's got this new perspective in life, mm -hmm. but he came from the old ways. Of course, you now have this dual perspective too. So, absolutely, it happens. It's a natural progression. Of, yeah, if you're doing it right, it's a natural progression. Yeah. Well, what you just said, like when you said, um, you know, you you had just said we were getting into like, it, you know, the coming of coming through what I went through. Yeah. Right. I think that that is the reason I was able to make it is because I, I made it from such a deep place mm -hmm. that all the wealth of knowledge I accrued on my way gave me the skills to survive now, yeah. which I don't think that people who go about things the conventional way can achieve the level of successes that that I've wanted to do, you know what I'm saying, or that you'd want to do because there, there's still a lot of fear. Yeah. And fear is the number one problem in anything, mm -hmm. right? In anything, in love, in business, in relationship, fear is the only thing that really holds you back. Yeah. Fear of not being able to pay your rent, fear of losing your wife, fear of whatever. Right. Fear is the biggest determining factor of everything. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I came from somewhere where all my fears were stripped away step by step. Like, yeah. I wasn't scared of prison. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I'm not scared of death. Yeah. Failing, so whatever. All like, of those things all. Yeah. as you go. So now I'm in the business world and I'm like, this shit's a piece of cake. <laughs> Yes, right. It's easy. I'll eat everybody's food in this room because I'm not scared of anything that comes with the repercussions. Of yeah. It. So like, you know, with Jay, right? Like, it's the same thing. He went through all these dualities and like learning himself and learning. And that's what happens to us. Like, uh -huh. same thing. Like, you go through and you're like, man, this shit's whack. Like, yo, there's shit that I do on Instagram that yeah. I did, that I did, you know, when I first started that I look back and I'm like, Jesus Christ, what a bozo. Like, <laughs> but that's self-realization. Yeah. You have to go through that to grow up. You right. Know what I mean? Exactly. A question I often get asked now is, where do I get my influences from? And further, where should young people in today's generation get their influences from? Is it still from the family? From friends? Is it from school? From the culture? Where should it come from when the whole world is literally right at your fingertips? The internet changed everything, you know, and... and, and in a good and a bad way, you have to deal with the pros and cons of it. And I think that one of the biggest cons is that it the access to lifestyles and the way people portray things is way too prominent. And yeah. people absorb that too quick. So, like, when you were growing up, you had very few influences that were deciding factors. Right. Your mom. Like your homies. Your mom, you know, your yeah. homies, and, like, maybe one or two people other mm -hmm. than that, right? Now it's like, who do I listen to? Yeah. And, you know, for a young mind and for parents in this world, mm -hmm. it's hard for you to be able to keep a stronghold when there's so many things going on yeah. that they, the kids don't know the inner workings of. Like, right. you know, people look at, like, the Kardashians as, like, idols. And you're like, mm -hmm. man, like, I get the hustle, but, like, is that what you want to be known for? Right. Like, do you want all those stigmas attached to the millions? Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, but yeah. there's kids that are fine with that. There's kids that, like, you know, like... No disrespect to Kanye or anybody, but like when your kids grow up and they search about you, which is the first thing they can do now, uh -huh. what do you want them to see? Right. You know? And I'm sure there's a lot of headlines that read like millionaire, celebrity, success, but then on page two of Google search, there's some <laughs> shit that you, I wouldn't want my children to see. Yeah, yeah. You know? So right. like, yeah, I think it's affected in like, you know, with the drug culture the way it is now. Mm -hmm. The drug culture is not the drug culture I grew up in. Uh -huh. Like the fact that you even asked, right? Like, was it a using or... Yeah. That's a real question now because now all the kids that are rapping are users. Yes. Like, I come from an era where that's, you're a cornball. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Using and yeah, yeah. you're a bozo. Like, I mean, you smoked. Uh huh. You smoked Bud or, or maybe some liquor or whatever. A few kids back then, like, I mean, maybe just some ecstasy or something, but like, you doing Zans and lean all day and like you're bugging. Like, yeah, that shit's crazy. You can't run a business that way. You no can't do what. anything yeah. that way. Like, right. how are you doing anything that uh -huh. way? How are you, like, honestly, you know, one of the biggest things I notice is, is, is like how safe the world is now. Yeah. What Can you, you imagine? That? You grew up in New York. Yeah. Right? Jersey, New York. Yeah. Same shit. Yeah. You grew up in the shit, right? Mm -hmm. And you grew up in it where, like, you know, right now I'm wearing a hundred thousand dollars worth of jewelry. Mm -hmm. You know, shout to Raffaello and Co. By the way, but like, how safe it is where you can be drugged up, zanned up with in all this jewelry yeah, with on, all this jewelry on, and yeah. you're not even on point, right? In in the New York that I grew up in, if you weren't on point, you was getting took. Yeah, the New York that I grew up in. You put your 20s in your sock. Right. You put the singles in your wallet. So when you get jacked, you're like, yeah, here's all my money. And you still got the socks. That's what right. I'm saying. Like, 
yeah. Somebody on Xanax can't even, he doesn't even know where his wallet is. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's like, it's so safe. Because right. all these kids is just running around having a good time. Yeah. And I'm glad that that energy is not there. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that the robbery and all that Are stuff. Are you really? Sometimes I wish, like... I mean, I, I, I wish there was a neighborhood, more... I'm, when yeah, it gets I, too gentrified, I'm like, there needs to be a shooting. Yeah, <laughs> I, wish there, I, I wish there definitely was a more realization, like yeah. a real a factor. I don't wish crime or harm on anybody, but I wish there was a more reala- realization and respect. Like, of respect, yeah. Yeah, because like, I went to Spike Lee's house. They had this Jordan event, mm-hmm. and he was talking about like how people, real estate agents, like rezone areas and name, name them some other shit. Yeah. Like Coral Gardens right. and... You know, Lafayette Greens, yeah. and I'm like, this two is, bridges, this is, Dumbo, yeah. This is Farragut Projects, fam. Don't call <laughs> this nothing but Farragut Projects. Right. Like, you know what I mean? So, yes, I, I, I do think that it's a factor, and it, you know, we just got to kind of like, we don't want to be those bitter old men always complaining, right? We just got to try to embrace it and move to, move forward the best yeah. we can. So, let's go back to some of your pedigree. So, you did styling, you went into sales, you're learning those two aspects. Mm-hmm. And then now you're sort of known as doing lifestyle consulting. Yeah, lifestyle right? marketing, brand development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is, for people who aren't really sure, and sometimes I'm not even really sure, but what does it mean when you like work with Pusha T and J Balvin on their lifestyle development? Um, it's a little different for both. Okay. You know, because Pusha was my foyer into the industry. He's the one that gave me my shot on music. He's like, look, everything that you know on the fashion side, you can apply to music. So I was working at Rock Nation. Um, when I did Billionaire Boys Club, I was the sales man sales manager for certain territories in in there, and then I developed for Pharrell's BBC line. Yeah, Pharrell's okay. Billionaire Boys Club. I worked. It was you know he has a partnership with Jay, mm-hmm. so um, I was doing sales there for that brand, and then we did we launched three other brands while I was there. We launched Beeline, we launched Black, we launched you know an ice cream division. Mm-hmm. So. Um, while I was there, you know, it's in the Rock Nation offices. So yeah. I build a good relationship with everybody there. Obviously, shout to Emery Jones, mm-hmm. who's a big, big inspiration, one of my big brothers. And once that partnership, they didn't split, but uh, the brand management went back onto I Am Other staff. Yeah. They offered me a job on Rock Nation to help Essentially, develop. Essentially, Pharrell took back 100% control of BBC, correct? Mm. Not I don't know the logistics of control, but um, they went back to like the development. Yeah, instead so, like, of doing it through Rock, doing it in yeah in conjunction with Rock. Right. Okay, um, but you stayed at Rock essentially. Yeah, so Emery offered me a position mm-hmm. on Rock Apparel to help launch you know some projects that they were working on because they were buying up brands and yeah. ro- launching planes, which is the paper plane mm-hmm. logo that everybody's familiar with now. Um, and me and Emery had such a good relationship. I was like, it was a no brainer. Like this is this is where I, this is home. You know what I mean? They're the ones who hired me and embraced me. And obviously Pharrell, huge Loic, Philip, you know, all those guys were huge inspirations and huge parts of my career. Um, but when I got offered the position, I I, I stayed there at Rock. Mm-hmm. But there was a transition period where I was kind of like in limbo. Yeah. And I didn't really have a task day to day. And then. I started working with somebody in the music marketing department who kind of saw me, saw the talent I had. I was like, hey, come here. Ask, you know, uh, what about this? What about this? What mm-hmm. about that? And he started asking me. So I started like, the first thing I did was like, I did like some small, you know, product runs for DJ Mustard. Mm-hmm. Like they wanted to do some giveaway stuff. So I came up with a, some cool concepts for that. And then Lenny S obviously would ask me my opinion. So I started learning that music and fashion marketing is the same. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's applying a certain principle. Like, you know, the easiest way for me to explain marketing is, you know, creating a... La- marketing is the language that you create between a consumer and a, and a product. Yeah. Right? It's and the messaging. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the language. It's right. how they speak to each other and how they relate to each other between a product and a consumer. That's a great way to put it. And thank you. And, you know, music is the same way. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, if I tried to pitch you right now on Lil Pump... Mm-hmm. You'd probably be like, this is not what I listen to, fam. Mm-hmm. But if I marketed to you a cool way, you'd respect the marketing and take a listen to the song. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. So that's what ended up happening. So I started learning that. And then Pusha was like, yo, you, nah, you home team, you coming with me. <laughs> and, you know, he was working on his album. And, you know, I, I had caught the tailwind of the last album. So, you know, his digital presence was something we really wanted to work on because... Push is the first internet rapper. Mm-hmm. People don't realize that. Like the clips yeah. and coming under Pharrell were the first hype beast rappers. You know, right. they used to call their fans the clipsters uh-huh. because it was all like 
college kids who'd go on internet, right? On find out about stuff, yeah, yeah forums and Nike Talk and where all the Bape and BBC that they were wearing, yeah. And they were the soundtrack to that music. I mean, you remember like yeah. we met the first time we ever met, aside from like me going to the store and being a super geek fan, um, and you being like, yeah, kid, whatever. There's a thousand <laughs> of you that come here every day. Um, was at um, sneaker one of those sneaker dunk sneaker exchange con, or one yeah, of those yeah through 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 um uh what's this what's this dude uh arrow from nike yeah so he's like yo you know this is jeff and i was like oh my god like finally he's like, oh, what's, hey what's up yeah i'm gonna go back over here and there's 90 other sneaker things i gotta do <laughs> um but again you know like that that show that I met you at, the Clips were performing, uh-huh. and they performed at all of those shows. They got yeah. booked for Dunk Exchange, Soul Collect, whatever, all right. of them. Um, and we're and, here at Soul DXB in Dubai right now. And Push is here. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and see we them? were just a week ago. We were in Sao Paulo at Maze Fest, and, and Push was yeah. there. So he's, he's always embracing this. Yeah, because the thing is, he's the conduit. Yeah, Kanye said it right. Everything is Pusha T. That that rant that he did. Yeah. But like, think about it. What's what's Jerry Lorenzo's brand called? Fear of God. And what was what was Push's first mixtape called? The Fear of God. Ah, uh, right. Good point. Touche. What was Virgil? What was Virgil's first brand called before Off White? Pyrex Vision. Pyrex Vision. Yeah. What is Pyrex Vision? That's right. <laughs> Pyrex turns yeah, turns into Cavalli yeah. first. That's Pusha, right? Yeah. Think about everything in that stream of things right. comes from Pusha. <laughs> You know, the Pharrell Association, yeah. you know, the, 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 the BBC and the Bape and the Play Clothes. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, you know, that that being said, you know, um, Pusha's digital presence, you know, he's a very laid back person. He's very quiet. And, um, you know, he basically was like, I want to create a new wave on my digital, on my socials. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do socials conventionally. So I came on board because that's something that I specialize in. And we started talking about how to incorporate his Adidas projects, his music, all of those things to the rollouts yeah. and how we were going to put them out to the kids mm-hmm. who were consuming all his information just on social media. So that's how I came on and that's kind of what I do there. It's amazing to hear how Mike honed all of his skills in sales by getting people to buy his shit, styling by telling people how to make it all look fly, and marketing I've literally never heard marketing described as succinctly as he just did. And social media, have you seen his IG stories? He honed all these skills and applied them to one of the most powerful platforms there is, music. And he did it with one of the most influential musicians in the game, Pusha T. The key point in this bit though, is when he was at Rock Nation, and he said he sort of didn't have a place and a specific thing to do there. We've all been there before, feeling aimless at a job, Maybe sitting at your desk and you start twiddling your thumbs, you start taking longer lunch breaks, start coming into work late, you start leaving work early. But the defining moment of a successful person is being able to work through these moments to find your purpose and make your place. Now, Balvin is a different story because Balvin, you know, Jay Balvin, who is an international Latin music Mm -hmm. star, you know, didn't have the conduit to American street fashion culture or fashion culture in general. Yeah. Because in the Latin music industry, that's not a thing. Like, right. style is questionable. Mm-hmm. It's and, I, and I'm Colombian. I'm <laughs> proud to be Hispanic. But, like, if you look at Spanish music stars, like... It's Mad Euro, right? The first thing you do, you don't think about fashion when you look at them, you know what I mean? But Jose has, like, a really, really strong love for fashion and and. Uh, as an outlet of creativity and um it reminds me a lot of pharrell Mm -hmm. as being able to expand his presence to multiple things so when we and him met he was like man i want to do this and i want to do collabs and i want to do you know fire merch but i want to have lifestyle boutiques and i want to do so i was like yo let's do that that's Mm -hmm. easy like this is how but you know it's it's getting his idea out in a materialization form that has nothing to do with his music yeah but it's also getting the American audience and the life and the European audience mm-hmm. to embrace him for things other than his music. Right. So it's been like that's my job. There is building that language again. It's marketing. It's yeah. building a language that it doesn't matter that he makes Spanish music. Everybody at GQ still fucks with him. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't know what the words are, but the vibe is there. Yeah. And as long as his look and his uh, you know his appeal and his understanding of what like the lifestyle project that he's working on is, they'll respect it. Mm-hmm. And it's my job to create that language. So our 
Pusha and Jay through your consultancy group? Yes. And do you still do any work with planes and rocks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Emery is always going to be my big brother. We still, yeah. anything, you know, anything he ever needs my advice on. They're not a client, you know, like a full-time client, but I'm always there. Yeah. We always chop up ideas. Anything they need me for, I'm there. So it's like, that's family. That'll always be. Yeah. They'll always be ingrained in what I do. When you sort of go through these projects, <laughs> do you see it more of like you're adding and layering on? Or do you feel like it's more like you have to put one to the side and then concentrate on another one? Um, it's tough because... Because there's only so much time... In, in a day. Yeah, yeah I know. Day, trust right? me. So how do you keep I mean, adding? Well, tell the people what time is this. Well, tell the people where we are. Right now, time. we're in Dubai. It's 1 a.m. in Dubai. Yeah. Um, well, it's 12.51 in Dubai, which means that in New York, it's 3.51. Uh-huh. And I and I landed today at 3. How long have you been here? Two days? Yeah. So you're still off the schedule. But yeah. again, it, we're doing an interview. We're doing a chat. But it's because like... Again, there's only so much time in the day we have to capitalize off all of it. Yeah. Push a la- push a landed 40 minutes ago. He'll be here in an hour or so, and then we gotta go. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. This this business is about really enjoying the you better enjoy the tentacles. It. Yeah, because it's not fun. No. If you don't if you don't really love this shit, it's not as fun right. as people think. Yeah. That's one of the things I always try to convey. Uh-huh. Like I, if you follow me, you'll notice I'll post like a video of me at the screen printer. You know, at five three merch or. or, or uh, my embroidery place and be there at three in the morning. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. like that shit's real. That means right. I only slept two hours before I had to be at this nine. Yeah, thing. you were saying like because of social, mm-hmm. all kids see is the good the bottles popping. The spinning yeah, ring I try not car. to. I try, listen. It's hard to encompass bad on in a visual way. I know the it's, work. I've tried to, <laughs> and it just doesn't look good. No, like no. I mean, and I, and it's not supposed to look good. But if I put myself creating a deck, right. At 2 a.m., how do I post do you that so that you nice? engage? Yeah. Kids are going to scroll by. They're like, oh, I don't want to see this. I don't Let me show see you this picture. Let me show you this picture. This is in Dubai. Ready? I don't know who shot this, but they tagged me on it. It's me in a construction vest and a desk <laughs> Look on a laptop. Are oh, you got glasses on? Yeah, I got, I got my sunglasses. I'm just like banging out a floor plan. But at you a see what I'm saying? Site. But it's hard to make this look good on the ground. Exactly. But <laughs> people who like us, yeah. again, this is why I say it's important because... It's hard to make it look good on the gram, but the kids who are looking to only look good on the gram aren't the ones that are going to make it. Right. So if you post that, and it's probably only going to get 200 likes, <laughs> yeah. but 80 of those kids are going to be like, fuck. Yes, you're Jeff, right. Jeff is doing, like, I need to get on Jeff level. Yeah. And, I, and those are the kids I want to reach because those 80 are going to change. Yeah. The entire 100,000 right. who didn't They're like going to give us work in 10 what? years. What? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, right? Um. I want to ask you about, because uh, you grew up in, obviously, entrenched in hip-hop culture. Yeah. And now, you know, there's this thing called street culture, yeah. which wasn't existent <laughs> back then. It's funny. Do you think hip-hop culture and street culture are the same, or do you see a difference between the two? No, it's a difference. Uh, Explain. The hip-hop difference. culture, to me, has a little bit more of a global appeal, because there's hip-hop culture in Brazil. Yeah. There's a hip-hop culture. Like... You know, Raekwon just went and did a, did a show in Brazil. Okay. That's, that. yeah, that's like a week after we left. Okay. So that's, you know, that's hip hop culture. Mm-hmm. That's people taking, that's a music that was made out of social angst that was spread across the world that everybody could relate to. Street culture, and we're talking like the street culture like that push is attached to. Yeah. There's a very different degree of understanding of what that is to uh-huh. me uh-huh. like street wear culture is, is a different it, thing yeah, it's another. yeah but street culture like like trap music mm-hmm. it's funny what i hear people call trap music now yeah to me that's like what they're calling trap music isn't tra- that's drug user music mm-hmm. that's not trap music <laughs> trap music is music that people it was like you know jay is a trap music artist uh-huh if you're talking about, like, if you listen to The Evils and yeah. you don't tell me that's a trap record, uh-huh. like, the South might have coined the term trap music for its sound, for its beats, yeah. for it talking about, because that was there, that, you know, that, that term may come from the South, but... By definition. By definition, yeah. The Evils is a trap record, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That's a trap record, and it's like, that's a very, very... Um, high taste level music mm-hmm. for the street. Yeah. And it was what Pusha makes and it was like, you know, Fab still makes that type of music. Like Jada Kiss makes that type of music. Like street culture to me isn't it, it isn't globally accepted, isn't globally understood because it's being marketed incorrectly. Will it be one day you think? Um I hope not. Really? Yeah, I hope not. Because I think street culture is something that 
allows people still to separate the categories of what you really who you're targeting something with. Mm -hmm. And I think if it spreads, it's going to get just as loosely based as everything else that's going on. Oh, so you think think it's 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 like like too diluted? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, um, think of like street culture, like uh, an American Express black card, Mm -hmm. right? Like you can get one, yeah, but like, do you, can you really have one? (laughs) You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, uh. Like, that's a stamp that people really cherish and walk around with the fact that like, you can walk into certain cities and people embrace you in the hood and, and pre- like you know that's one of the things me and Pusha try to do everywhere we go, um, and I do it for sure. Like when I was in Paris, I went to the hood. Mm-hmm. When I went to Brazil, and it's not like some cool, I'm tough, shoot 'em up, bang bang, you know, hood shit. It's that's corny. Yeah, it's about seeing people. The heart of the city is always in the hood because the hood is represented by people who have, who are making something out of nothing. Mm-hmm. When I went to Brazil, all the people that worked at the hotel live near favelas. Yeah. Like, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, and that's why I go. I want to show them, listen, yo, like, I'm coming to fuck with y'all because I'm in your city. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying the best of your city. And I know that that city wouldn't run without you guys. Yeah. That's why I go to the hood. Right. I don't to go to the, the hood to be essence. like, you know, I'm in the, I'm hood. the hood. I'm yeah. safe. <laughs> that, that shit's corny. Uh-huh. Like, I, I, I've always thought that was so corny. Like, yeah. I'm good everywhere. Like, no, you're not. You're not bulletproof. Right. Like, if you really wanted to be touched, like, somebody could get you touched. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just the na- the nature of wor- the world. Yeah. Um, you know? And uh, I think that going to the hood and showing respect and showing love to those people is important. So, I don't know if there's a hood in Dubai, but if there is, I would like to go check there it is, out. There is, I think. Yeah. There is? Yeah, yeah. We should go check that out. Yeah. So, if you follow up scale on any of his socials, you'll see that he's on a first-name basis with so many influential people. Now, hopefully one day you'll also be on this level, but in this hustle, that's only level one. What you are able to take away from these interactions is what separates the boys from the men. Mike breaks down what he was able to peel off from each of his mentors. Um, You obviously got to be in touch with a lot of amazing people. You mentioned Emery, you mentioned Pharrell, you mentioned Pusha. Can you give us a key like what's one of the key learnings from each of them because to me those three guys are so influential in their own ways right of course but i mean so jesus diff- christ but like, so different too and that that's the beauty so right what, like, so tell me what's the the learning from each one that you took away from all right so the first thing to do when you want to learn from anybody that you look up to is figure out your commonalities yeah okay. um and i got another piece of advice yeah go ahead don't ever ask them Okay. Like what? What can I learn from? Can I? Can, can you mentor me? <laughs> do people me? do that? Yeah. What? No, I not can that. you mentor me, but like, can, what can I learn from yeah, you? Yeah. What can I learn from you? Teach me some. That's crazy. That's like like you're a show pony. <laughs> yeah. Right? Hey, look at how I <laughs> look how I balance this Nike. <laughs> like what the fuck? That's crazy. I've never heard that. Yeah. I'm glad I haven't heard that. Um, because I'd black on you. Um. That's a great piece of advice, man. I'm gonna take that for myself. Not that I've used it, but I'm gonna take it to implement to kids that ask me. Yeah. You know. Um, but the, 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 the key to it is learning the commonalities and let me tell you why. If you connect with somebody who you looked up to and you looked up to them for certain reasons, but then you realize that you don't have any commonalities, it's going to be really difficult for you to take a blueprint Mm -hmm. and follow that blueprint because you're following something that doesn't reign true to you as a person. Right. You're perpetrating yourself. In in a in a way, yeah. you know, not you in a try. bad way, yeah. but you're trying to say, man, I really love Jay's journey. But it's not you. But that's Jay's journey. Yeah. And and even if you don't, if you have like three or four commonalities, that's good. Like you can find your own approach mm-hmm. and you can retool their blueprint. But if you're following somebody that you really naturally don't have a large portion of commonalities with, you're kind of gonna be fucked, yeah. right? Like you, you're a big inspiration to me, but I wouldn't want to follow, be mentored by you because mm-hmm. our commonalities wouldn't allow me to excel in the world that you excel in. Mm-hmm. But what I can do is if I look up to you and I realize what our, what, how little our commonalities are, I can pull away the things that you've done and figure out how to retool those for myself. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And like the reason it hit me and the reason that I learned that is because of what we started the conversation with. 80% of my followers don't know what I do for a living. And that's a problem. They just want the lifestyle. You just want the lifestyle. Yeah. So you, you don't even know the commonalities we have. You right. don't even know that if you really do want the lifestyle. Yeah. Like, do you know how tired I get? Do you know how, <laughs> like, how unhealthy I am? Do you know how often <laughs> I got to go to the doctor? Like, is this what you want? Do you want to not sleep this many? You right. only want to eat one meal. Yeah, I'm the hood Anthony Bourdain, but I eat one meal a day. Right. It's terrible. Yeah. 
It's super bad for There's you. There's mad sacrifices. And it's not about them being not being able to be ready to make those sacrifices if, is if those sacrifices are the right ones for you. Yeah. So that's the one thing I always take with them, find our commonalities. It just so happens that with all three people you mentioned, I have very strong commonalities with. Okay. But you they're know? very different people. Right? So but how do you have commonalities with these three very but that's distinctly the, different people? But that's the beauty of it. And so that's break why it down. What's the commonality for you? So we'll one? start with Emery, right? Like okay. Emery went to prison uh-huh. for something he, you know, some, something he did. But he stood to his morals. <clears throat> he stood up who, who he was and he didn't expect any handouts just because of his circle. Mm-hmm. And that's the same person I am. Mm-hmm. Like I had a bunch of people when I came home from, from doing what I, my little time that was like, man, let's do this, let's do that. And I was just like, nah, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to figure it out. And it's been a struggle. And the only handout I took was from my sisters, man, because I knew there'd be a payback. Mm-hmm. But um, that was our commonality, that we weren't going to let our, our felony records and our crime past define who we were. And we weren't going to take no for an answer. Uh, with Pusha, our commonalities are the high taste level understanding of where we come from. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Pusha has a high, such a high taste level and aspirational goals yeah. from where he comes from. Like, he comes from Virginia crack era. Like, that shit was wild. Right. Right? Like, people don't talk about Maryland, Virginia. Or, you know, after The Wire, it was a conversation. Mm-hmm. But prior to that, people don't know how nasty it was. And he came from that to, like, you know, this guy, he's at Nobu five days a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. like, him wanting the best of the world is, it comes from a genuine place. A taste and, level and an appreciation. Yeah, and, craft. like, even his rap and his music, yeah. like, that all is for me. Like, we're the type of person when we see somebody who we think is corny rocking something that we started, we off it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that taste level is a commonality that's important in what we build because it's the same thing with socials. Right. If we're doing something like... If his captions sound like somebody else, we not doing the right job. Mm-hmm. So our commonality is there. And then who's the third person? Balvin? Pharrell. Oh, Pharrell. Wow. Now, Pharrell's a whole different thing. Um, and I always tell people this. The only two men I've ever looked up to, aside from like in my inner circle of fat, like my father, um, is Pharrell and Jay. Mm-hmm. Jay for his business and his relatability from the street. And Pharrell, because Pharrell was the first person that taught our entire street culture, the real street culture. Mm-hmm. That you can be from there and still act and be and wear whatever you want and say whatever you want. And it's cool. Like, you know, honestly, Pharrell, Pharrell single-handedly took away all my fears about fashion, mm-hmm. about, like, homophobia. Yeah. like The bravery that he has. The yo, courage. Yeah. Be- and because he's that motherfucking dude. Like, yeah. you see Pharrell, don't think he's pussy. Mm-hmm. Like, don't, don't take his kindness for weakness. Like, yeah. Pharrell's still a Virginia dude. Like... He'll still talk some shit, and uh-huh. he still pop shit, and he still, you know, he had he like, come on, his woman, like his female background, like what woman doesn't didn't want Pharrell at one point, yeah, you know, so like all of those things that people, oh yeah, Pharrell's man, gay painting his hair, my hair's dyed right now, uh-huh. you know what I'm saying? These are things that like I learned. So we we may not have any too many commonalities, but he gave me like a rubric to get outside of my box. Without him, I don't think I'd be as eclectic. How long you know. does it take for you to know that you have commonalities with someone? Um, like two conversations. Like you just read it, like radar. Yeah, because the thing is of how people carry themselves. Yeah. You know, where I come from, uh-huh. you know, and how you gotta I grew read up. People you got to read people super quickly. Yeah. You know, and especially like in prison, you know, uh-huh. like in prison, like that shit changes Friend you or foe. a lot. Yeah. No, yeah. not even that, but like there's, there's faux friends. Right. You know, there's like COs, like it's an entirely different governing mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. So going to prison matured me a lot faster than I should have. Yeah. In different ways, like not as a man, but mentally. Yeah. You know, being it, being, having the capacity to understand how to deal with 30 different men from 30 different back, you know, you're in a mm-hmm. dorm yep. sleeping next to 30 different personalities. Yeah. How can this happen? Like, how do you manage this? Yeah. Some people don't didn't make it, and, and they lash out, and some people are violent, and, so, and or they click up with gangs because they don't have the mental capacity to manage this right. situation. Right. Institutionalization is real. Yeah. So, like, my senses for that went to a thousand in mm-hmm. prison because I was like, even somebody, the way they ask you something, yo, let me borrow that. Yeah. Yo, let me borrow that could mean 90 different things. Yeah, the way they ask is like... Yo, yeah. it could mean 90 different things. Word. Yo, it's your turn on the phone. That could mean seven different things. Uh-huh. 
Is my right. son on the phone like, I better get on now or I can't get on later? Is that what you're telling me? Or are you telling me like, yo, get on the phone now because I need it right now after you? Or are you telling me, yo, you know, you could get you good. How are you saying it to yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Those shit, you got to pick that shit up quick, man. Right. Because if not, it could, it could cause you harm. Like, you yeah. can die. Yeah. <laughs> you can die in jail. If you read that wrong. Hell yeah. yeah. I've yeah. seen motherfuckers come home that I was in the same dorm with go home with a lifetime scar on their face. Mm-hmm. Because when somebody told them, hand me that. They interpreted it the wrong way. Right. Now, I don't, like, I'm not trying, I wasn't trying to be a victim of that circumstance. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, my, my senses got sharpened, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. And, so um, when you walk into, like, a boardroom situation and you got it looks like a, CMO, it looks, it, CEO, you're probably like, this is, it looks this like, is like when I walk into a, checkers. when it looks like a, when I, de- I'm being dead honest with you, when I walk into 90% of the rooms that I walk into, it looks like a buffet. It looks like a big buffet. Like, and you're I'm the a, shark. I'm going to eat this motherfucker's food. <laughs> this nigga can't keep up with me. I don't care how big he is in the company. He doesn't know more than I do. Mm-hmm. It's just how I feel, man. It's, yeah. just how, it's just how I function. Right. And, and it's probably true. Because they haven't seen as, a as quarter of, of the shit that you've seen. As of so far. No matter yeah. how big their LinkedIn page and might I don't be. want people to think that... I also don't want people to think that just because of the crime factor or the prison factor is what made me that sharp. Mm-hmm. It's my interpretation of the world once I came home and was able to acclimate. The corniest motherfuckers in the world that be like, yeah, I did 10 joints, man. I just came home from doing 10 joints. And I'm like, all right, well, what do you have to show for it? Yeah. You came home and did 10 What are you doing right now with that experience, with right. that wealth of knowledge? Are you putting it back in a positive way? Are you creating a bit? What are you doing? Yeah. Or are you just always going to be the toughest nigga forever? Like, right. okay, so you're scary. Okay, and yeah. what? Yeah. Like, You'll die at one point, mm-hmm. and then then what will you yeah. be? So yeah. like when I come with that aggression, I don't think I'm better than them because I've survived worse things. I think I'm better than them because I went through a, a huge experiences, was able to come on top. But I'm using those against them in a business format. Yeah. So when in a room, if you walk into a room and say, you know, uh, millennials in the Midwest aren't buying this. Mm-hmm. You know, and we don't understand why because the algorithm shows us that they should be. And I'm like, that's the problem. You've never walked into a mall in Alabama mm-hmm. and had fifty thousand dollars in your pocket and not be able to spend it, mm-hmm. or see another drug dealer in the mall, see another kid in the mall in Alabama or in Wyoming or in Arkansas, all these dope, really yeah. drug heavy cities, and find out what the economy is like. Uh-huh. So I'm gonna take that little tidbit of information that I got when I was there. And I'm going to turn it into an asset on mm-hmm. the business side. Okay, you know what you guys need to do? There's some community outreach that's missing. There's some um, brand lists that are, you know, some brand lists that are miss- yeah. have gaps there. Right. That's what you don't know. You're looking at numbers. Yeah. I have an experience with people. Mm-hmm. So that's why I walk into rooms like that. You right. know what I mean? And I think it's important for your consultancy's sake that you're there not trying to eat these people alive. You're there trying to help the brand. And yeah. I, I, I have this problem too when I walk into a lot of these boardrooms. I'm like... Y'all don't care about the brand. Mm-hmm. I'm here to, to help this brand. Right. I don't know why you're here. I think right. you're here to work out till your pension kicks in. Right, You're right. here to, like, cash in on your check, you know? What like, do you, like, one, th- one, one thing I always wondered, right, it was, like, you were one of the first people that were able to sit on the other side of the table, mm. right? So, like, how do you make sure that you remain sharp when you've already achieved that one, like... I know how to achieve, if I achieve success and stay focused, that's mm-hmm. easy. But when you're on the other side of the table and have seen like how treacherous that world is, yeah. how do you jump back on the other side and still remain true to your product? I think I had, yeah, I didn't try to do it on purpose, but I had my clothing line and I had Reed Space, mm. which was, it's very ground Like a testing floor. ground? Yeah. Mm. That's like real ground floor shit. But now you sit with corporate America, though. So how do you go back to those, even if you do or don't have those brands? Like, how do you maintain the neutrality of what you're doing? Like, do you ever go back on the other side and be like, "Fuck, that one was that one was brutal. That one was just for the check." Like, how do I how do I clean this one up? Like, or does that not even happen? No, it doesn't happen. There's definitely things I do for the check, but they have to still mean something to me. Of course, it still has to be on my. So that's what resonates. To just always make sure that the moral compass is aligned with that. Yeah. I, I try to do that too, but I... And the but moral you, compass... But the difference between me is they're going to come to me and I can say yes or no for a check. The reason I ask you is because you, you've you been a gatekeeper, but then you've also been on the other side of the table mm-hmm. by giving people those deals. So do you do you remember all those things? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And that's why I love what like Jay and Rock Nation and Emery does because they have to live on both sides of the table as well. Yeah, that's it's a it's a real tough thing. I know that's why I asked you because I know their way of doing it. Yeah. But your way has to be completely different. 
I, the one thing that I think resonates is that knowing what's right and what's wrong. And right. just to be able to man up and be like, you know what? I don't care how much money we're going to make out of this. That shit's just wrong. I wouldn't want you to treat me that way. And the fact that you might even be proposing right. to treat somebody that way means that one day you're going to try to do that to me. Right, right, right. You right. know what I mean? How, how, like how many times does that come back to bite you in the ass? Where I turned it down or I took it? You mean? Where, you, where you took it. Where you said your piece and it, did, it didn't go that way. Uh, well, if I say my piece, I live with it. Right. I don't, I don't it's regret cool. it. Yeah, it's totally cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, those are the things you got to learn, man. Like, those yeah. are the things I haven't seen yet. Walking man. away is a lot harder, you'll find. And saying no to that check is, yeah. is much harder. Saying no is much harder than saying. You could say yes to everything. Right. You could yes man it to death, yeah. you know, and just take yeah. everything that comes Those are the way. things that scare me, Yeah, you know, because I have so many... I have a skill set that's kind of been honed into what I do, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'm around so many people that inspire me that I'm like, man... I hope I'm prepared for the time that I'm on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yo, Mike, I ask the questions, you answer them. That's how this works. <laughs> nah, but I'm glad Mike flipped this question on me, and now I'm going to take the time to reflect on this further, because this is my show when I get to do that. <laughs> to the young individual listening to this at home, if you do your job right, and if you hone your skills correctly, eventually, people companies and organizations will start throwing money at you. When Mike talks about being on the other side of the table, he means the side of the table that controls the purse strings. So picture yourself at a job interview. You're sitting at a table. Your side of the table is asking for the money, right? The other side of the table is controlling how much money gets spent. That's the table Mike is referring to. Now in an ideal world, Every time someone offers you a check, it will be in perfect alignment with your moral compass. Do you feel super good about taking this check in exchange for the services you're about to render? Or do you feel just a little bit icky? Or do you feel really straight up gross about it? In an ideal world, it's all gravy. Good money, good vibes. In a worst case scenario, you get offered bad money and it's bad vibes. Those are fine to me because those are deals that are easy to walk away from. But what if it's ridiculous money you've never seen before in your life and kinda so-so vibes? This is where it gets tough. And this is where the moral compass kicks in, helping you to hopefully make that right decision. Moral compass is really just another way of saying intuition. And being able to read your own intuition is a major skill set to acquire. You've now, in, in addition to everything that you've done, You've now become your own brand, I would say, in recent years, right? It's so fucking weird. Man. Yeah. Like, so now you're a brand, too. Yeah. I hate and now that. when you speak on social and you do it so well, but like you're, you're, you're the host of your own live 24-7 talk show. Yeah. How I does hate, that? I hate it. But you're good I at it. it. So what do you? Uh, I'm good just because it's me. Yeah. It's not hard to be good at being you yeah. if you're really you online. Like. Yeah. There's nobody, and this is something I can really, I don't have to knock on wood, like, there's nobody walking the earth that will ever meet meet you and mm -hmm. be like, man, I knew Mike when he was 17. That's not him. <laughs> He's fronting every, and it, it happens on my social all day. Uh -huh. Kids come up, yo, we went to high school together. You know, mm -hmm. you were, I can't believe you're doing the exact same thing you said you were going to do. <laughs> That's dope. It's crazy, yeah. you know, but it's it's just because you got to remain true to me, you, you uh -huh. know what I'm saying? Be you. And, and also be very clear at showing your mistakes and like owning up to your bullshit and when you're broke you're broke like people don't say that like mm -hmm. people don't be like yo i'm hurt i'm hit right now yeah i'm hit sometimes like uh -huh. i'm i'm independent yeah like yeah you see me stunting but like there's a lot that goes up and down with that stunt sometimes a bill might have got missed or mm -hmm. like it might just we might just not be able to do noble that week like right. It happens, yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm not rich, right. you know. It may look like that, uh -huh. but I try my hardest to show you that it's not like that. Yeah, and I'm working towards it. And I think the more transparent I am, the more people connect with me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, How are you at? So I mean, you you know you you represent a lot of individuals and a lot of brands in the past. Yeah. How are you at representing you yourself? How do you negotiate <laughs> yourself? I, I that's why I, that's why I said I hate it because this is the problem. Um. Being an influencer mm -hmm. is is the antagonist of being a consultant. If everything that I consult on has success depends on my influence, influence. it's a bad I'm a bad consultant. Yes. And you're kind of fucked. Yeah. Kids don't know that, 
But if kids you think, oh, you lit. Yeah. Think, oh, he, no, you he get said, shoes? Yo, you he's get- lit. Yo, for every fucking one pair of shoes they send me, I buy seven, fam. <laughs> Fuck are you talking about? Yeah. But now, never mind the money I spent because because I posted one free shoe, you think all the eight that I got are free. Yeah. So how does that help me? Mm-hmm. In my scope of trying to show, look, this is how you go about doing this. Make sure you don't need anybody. That's why, listen, you know why I buy seven pairs of shoes? Aside from the fact that I'm a fucking addict. Mm. Because I want everybody who ever gives me anything to know that I don't need them. Yeah, I agree. I buy. Please Bro, put, send it back. I buy. Send it back. I don't yeah. need it. I'm right. cool. Yeah. Like, you know why? Because you'll never be able to dictate what I say or what I do or what I wear because you gave me something. Yeah. And luckily, everybody that gives me stuff knows that mm-hmm. and gives me stuff because they honestly want me to wear it. Yeah. And I think the industry sees, you mentioned influencers versus consultants. The better you are being an influencer, I think they automatically see you actually have no skill set. No skill set. Other than being an influencer. And, no, and listen, so there is... double no, But you actually could be good at, but you could be influential and good at your job, but I think... You have to know how to separate the lines. Yeah, but and the, that's what I try to do, and that's why I hate being an influencer. <laughs> you know, I just recently started showing my face. You've been following uh-huh. me for a while. like. But the reason I've been doing that is because I realized it's unfair to kids who relate to me not being able to have a figurehead to say, all right, you are a real person. Yeah. So if I'm never showing my face, if I'm not taking pictures, if I'm not... Signing autographs, then am I really connect, am I really yeah. somebody that they're connecting to? Right. And then then everything I'm doing is like counterproductive. Yeah, I'm the same. I realized a couple of years back that I had to step in front of the curtain. I'm yeah, I know because I used to try to do that. I was a, I was one of the people like yo, <laughs> trying Jeff, to get behind the curtain. <laughs> no, for you, fool. Like I used to be like Jeff, can you sign this? And you'd be like, yeah, just give me one second. Like, but now you're a lot more yeah. because you were shyer back then of your your celebrity. Yeah. Now you understand that people connect to you and, mm-hmm. and have followed you for a long time. Yeah. Like, you know. I understand why you do it because I have to do it myself. Yeah. You know, it's a lot different for you because you actually have a product that you've put out. Mm-hmm. I've never put out a product that's mine. Mm-hmm. Like on Noir, we were found, we found it. It was ours, but the product wasn't mine. I didn't design it. I didn't say Upscale Vandal. I didn't say Mike Camargo. I didn't say yeah. none of that. You know, I very rarely have put out anything that's mine. Mm-hmm. So people ask me to sign other things that I'm like involved in. It's weird. <laughs> right. You can sign a staple shirt. Uh-huh. You can sign a pigeon dunk. Yeah. It's your thing. Yeah. yeah. I understand. But when people come up to me asking for an autograph, it fucking it freaks me out. All entrepreneurs have been at this crossroad. The decision of whether to take the stability of a paycheck from a company versus the freedom and risk of doing it on your own. It's definitely not for everyone. And each person has their own unique set of circumstances. If you're supporting other people, that will play a factor in your decision. If you have certain expenses that you just can't sacrifice, that will play a factor. If sleep is important to you, that will play a factor as well. With the amount of connections Mike has, I wonder if he has ever thought of cashing in his entrepreneurial chips and taking the corner office for the man. So now that you have your own consultancy and you're basically the the owner of your own company, mm-hmm. right? How is is this better this way than than working for someone and getting a steady check? Oh man, that's not even a question like being your own boss is the only is the only way I'd ever be able to see life. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'd ever take a corporate gig ever again. I, I don't think I corporate ever. gig meaning like do you consider rock corporate gig? Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, unless it's a, but then you get a, rock like is every rock week is you rock. get a paycheck. You know what you're gonna get. No, nah, but rock, rock is different. Rock is home home team. Yeah. So I'd consider anything with rock. Okay. Because they're family. They, yeah. They help build my career. I okay. you help build my career. Um. So I consider anything there, but like, um, yeah, I understand the stability of income and all that stuff, and being able to shift culture on a bigger level. Like if I was an executive at Nike or something, mm-hmm. um, and those are positions I consider, but not being able to do what I want, say what I want, whenever I want, is something that I, I that freedom I don't think I'll trade yeah. for for finance. But how are you now living check to check? Is it life is gravy? Like is it um, a no, no. Ride? I mean, no. We, I mean. Uh, all the money goes back into the business mm-hmm. and I spend a lot of money to make money. As you know, mm-hmm. like pitching for projects that you don't get is yeah. a loss. Yeah. People don't know that. <laughs> yeah. People think you that spend like money to pitch a project. Yeah. What? Mad money. <laughs> it's a per- it's a portion of your budget. People yeah. don't know how much I spend to pitch a project and there's a lot of times I don't get it. Mm-hmm. So that's lost money. But that's investing in my company. Um but, you know, things are okay. Right, you know, this year has been has been on the up and up and um my finances are managed pretty well, and mm-hmm. you know I'm trying to grow right now. But I do take some L's, and 
There are times where I take a loss and money isn't coming in, and I might not have a a, a client on retainer for that for that three month span. Yeah. Um, but it happens, and I'm fine with those because it teaches me what to do better in uh-huh. the upcoming year. So I'm cool with that. Does all the money go back into the company, or uh, do you like mostly, pay yourself? No, I don't pay myself. All of it goes back. Okay, into the all company. of it goes back. Yeah, I mean my expenses all come out of the yeah. company money, but um, you know I splurge here and there. You know. Yeah. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little Raffaello and Cole visit here and there never hurt nobody. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's a part of the costume. I know. So now that we have a much better understanding of who Mike Upscale Vandal Camargo is and where he came from, and now that we know he calls himself a consultant, I wanted to put him on the spot a bit and ask him what advice he gives to a brand that is struggling, particularly in the very competitive sneaker market a culture that is near and dear to both of our hearts. All right. So the first advice I'd give a a company that's trying to fix themselves is self-realization. Go through a period of self-realization. Really find out and put out, and this doesn't, won't ever happen. I know because I know these companies, but that's the only way to fix a problem Mm -hmm. is to really wash out and, and, and do a self-realization period where you're saying, this is what we did wrong. We have to own up to these Fix those errors mm-hmm. and then move forward. Why is it so hard for a company to, to look at themselves in the face? Um, because a company is a multi is a multi it's multifaceted and it, uh, different branches are responsible for different things. If you go to a Nike or a Jordan or an Adidas or whoever, the marketing department won't take credit for bad product. Yeah, they'll more likely point the finger that it's sales, right. it's designed. Yeah, yeah, and that's the problem with working with a company, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the no thing. No one wants to take accountability. Nobody wants to take accountability, which is why it, it's one of the things that frustrates me about working in that world because. You know, it's hard to fix something that's broken because of, you know, gaps in time. Like, for example, and this is no shot. Like, I, it's hard for me not to take shots at anybody. But let's say a company like, I'll give you a good example of who's doing it. Reebok. Right? Okay. Reebok took a, a sharp L mm-hmm. for a long time. Mm-hmm. They were always in the competitive, like, top five or whatever. Yep. But they took a sharp L. And I think that Reebok is doing phenomenally right now. Because they're looking at where they are lacking. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we fucked up here by... We had a little hype in these basketball zones. So everybody go to basketball. Fuck everything else. Mm. And it's like, nah, man. Reebok was lifestyle. Reebok had so many cultural moments. Yeah. And then I think that... I don't know how the system worked, but they looked and said, okay, we're probably fucking up and we need to allocate some attention. And let's wash away the revamps of the 90 different fucking shoes that we already don't sell. Mm -hmm. Right? And let's fix that. And, you know, they hired Frank the Butcher, Mm -hmm. who is the cultural god. Like, Frank knows every moment that happened in sneaker culture that meant something. Yeah. And his job was to go in there and pick, like, beacon-style things Mm -hmm. to to, to develop. But he's doing it in such a real way that works for Reebok. Mm -hmm. None of the projects that Frank has put out don't look like Reebok. They don't look like they're chasing anybody. They look like they're Reebok. Yeah. And... You know, I think that it takes a lot more than one person. Mm-hmm. If every department at Reebok did that, I think they'd be okay. I think they'd be in really good shape. So you're saying Reebok is a brand that was able to look at themselves squarely in the face and make a change. Yeah. Okay. Um, but a lot of companies don't. Uh-huh. Like Under Armour isn't doing that. Yeah. You know, and I know because I've sat with them. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've sat with them and the one project I did with them was a smash. Yeah. And then I see the glimpse of hope in there, and it's just like it's too big of it's like the Titanic. It's too big of a machine yeah. to move quickly, and they have the money, but it's like, bro, how many like the shoe is just the logo on the shoe is just not accepted. It's a badly designed shoe. Wear yeah, that logo. <laughs> like, yo, if I was at Under Armour, do you know how fucking quickly I would have jumped on the dad shoe meme mm-hmm. instead of trying to ignore it and yeah. fight it? I would have killed it. Yeah. If I was on the digital team, own this shit. I would have listened. I would have had like memes of like a curry shooting up a monarch. Uh-huh. Like <laughs> all types of dad swag beefs. Yeah, yeah. Like I would have I would have went and outfitted um all the dads on TV. Like, uh-huh. you know, all the fucking dad Sitcom swags. Dads like, shit. no, I would have done fucking uh uh what's it in Silicon Valley. Uh-huh. Like they all dress dad swag, right? right. Like had you them know, all wear it. Yeah, I would have had them all wear it and make a joke about like embrace that shit. Learn how to flip that shit instead of saying like, no, you know, they'll learn to love the logo. Like, are you fucking dumb? <laughs> they'll learn to love the logo? Is that what you is that really what you're hoping for? Is for kids to just to say, Oh, you know what? 
this UA on my shit is just, eh, it's cooler than the swoosh. You're, you're fucking dumb. Well, let's you know? see how it works out for them. <laughs> hey, call what me, are your, man. What are your thoughts on uh, Brand Jordan right now? F- on fire. Okay. On fire. But I, the, the sales reports say they're struggling. Um, again, this is the thing that I'm talking about. It's about a company have being a big ship and there being different things. The sales reports are struggling. This is one of the this is one of the unfair factors of putting Jordan against every company. Jordan was built off a legacy of shoes that are retros, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Meaning, there for the brand to create new product is very rarely accepted because kids are so attached to a legacy. Yeah. Right. That they won't embrace new things because there is a there's a far attachment that's attached to one person. Right. Nike is not attached to one person. Mm-hmm. It's attached to multiple people. Yeah. And like all those people had their own legacy. The Agassi, you know, Andre Agassi developed a whole generation of sport tech look right. that they can feed off of and do other silhouettes off of that remind them of that. Same thing for like. You know, Nike uh, baseball with Griffey. Like, yeah. they did all this cross-training thing that mm-hmm. they were able to feed off of. Jordan has one guy. Yeah. His name is the shoe. Mm-hmm. So, so that legacy, legacy is yeah. shadowing. So they have to make magic and volume and but, a multi-dollar billion dollar business with one legacy of but shoe. people hold them up to Nike swoosh as like the same. Right. Do that. It's unfair. Yeah. But think about it. All the new product that they've done, like the Dirty One, mm-hmm. was Stupid mm-hmm. fire again. It was based off of the legacy of something that was done, but that shit was murder. Like, yeah. but kids don't give it the shot because now kids don't have any sauce. Mm-hmm. Like, kids nowadays they don't have their own like swag. They're rebuilding off of swag that's been existed already. Yeah. So like, it takes a brave kid to wear a shoe that wasn't popular at one point, right? And make it popular. Yeah. Like a 16 or a 23 or whatever. Like All your friends are wearing Stan Smiths and stuff. Like, right. You're going to come so, in with a Jordan 31. Like. Yeah, exactly. Or a Jordan 16, like a retro that wasn't as popular yeah. or a 14 or whatever. So, you know, I think they're doing phenomenally, especially with like their special engine projects. Like, uh, you know, like Gmo Wong and Frank Cooker's department. Like, um, man, like, have you seen the shit they're putting out? Like special, like the way they're dropping stuff even? Yeah. Like, Innovation is not the issue there. Like they know what they're doing. They know how to tap in. They know how to. Nobody, nobody right now in footwear is telling better stories than them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell me one person. I Even know. their shoe revamping. Like, look at how they're doing. Um, look how they did the Alayli May shoe mm-hmm. and the story that it told. Right. Mm-hmm. Like when they go and put it in a swamp meet, like. You know, yeah. in Sloss and Swamp, like they told the story A to Z. Like when they dropped the jaw. My one of my favorite things they've done was the Spike Lee do the right thing for, mm-hmm. which was really limited. They rented out Spike Lee's actual house, redid Mookie's room, right. and then you were able to get the Jordan Four with the scuff on it from mm-hmm. the movie, like full storytelling. And yeah. it's like you know, it's a Jordan Four. How many more ways can you tell the Jordan Four story without Mike? You know. Mm-hmm. So I think Jordan is doing a phenomenal job, and their new product is all ill. Like the fact that they brought back Trunner is like. And yeah. then they revamped them. And like, you got motherfuckers wearing trunners again. Like, right. that's not that's, easy, that's man. That's not easy. That's yeah. not easy, but they're doing it. Okay, final advice for someone who looks up to you. Um, my first advice would be you know, get to the roots. Mm-hmm. Get to the roots of what made me me and what made you you. Like, the pigeon dunk, all those things, beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. Things to aspire for me, design my own shoe, just create my own brand, have my own space. But get to the roots. Maybe, re- like, everybody wants to recreate somebody's highlights. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to mimic and create their own highlight from somebody else's highlights. Nobody wants to go and create a low light. Yeah. Nobody wants to create a bad time. And I think kids should do that. Mm. I'm not saying go to jail. Right. <laughs> but not I'm saying way. like... Make mistakes. Make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And make, the, make, make mistakes in the realm of what the mistake that propelled you to go to where you were. Yeah. Like get fired a few times. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever it is that propelled... Or, or maybe not get fired a few times, but don't... Worry about getting fired. Do things that yeah, might yeah. get you fired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And 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 with me, you know, with with my, if somebody was like, "Yo, I want to, I want to model myself after you," you know, go to the root. Yeah. Because that's where really all the sauce came from was mm-hmm. me, you know, moving through these channels. Yeah. And and figuring it out that all those little sprinkles that came after where anybody could, you can get that you on your own, but go to the roots. You What's know. What's the most common mistake you see him make? Hmm. Because you run into a lot Talk, of young... Talking. And not doing? And not Just, listening. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
I see that's the biggest mistake I see with anybody is how much they want to talk to me. Mm. Go do and listen. Mm-hmm. Are you really listening? Like right. when kids come up to me, they're like, yo, I want to build. I want to do da da da. Yo, my man. This, you know what I hate the most, bro? And this, this may sound like a dick move, but I'm doing it. Maybe kids will start listening not to do this. Don't connect. Don't correlate yourself to me or anybody you meet. Why? Why are you doing that? I'm, no, I'm being serious. If, I'm, if I met with you and I'm like, yo, Jeff, man, honored to meet you, bro. Great. Yo, my uncle John, he used to do production at the house where you did your staple shirts. And you're like, dope. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, so like my Uncle John, ha- yo, so we should do this. Why? Introduce me to your Uncle John, <laughs> not you, you fucking idiot. That's, the, that's so common. I know. Bro, I but why? 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 I don't know why they do that, but they're, it's because it's like they're it's trying. It's a nervous to, reaction. No, it's not. It's they're trying to even the playing field between you and them. Right. They're trying and to they're find trying, a connection point that is not Don't do that. Rooted, don't though. do that. Yeah. Because you're trying to come up. Why are you trying to connect to me? Right. Learn from me. Mm-hmm. If I'm a, if I'm in a level where you want to be at, don't try to level, level in a conversation. Yeah, 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 don't try to level ourselves in a conversation right. when I just met you. Yeah. I fucking hate that. Uh-huh. I hate when a nigga comes up to me and my is like, yo, man, yo, um, my cousin, you know my cousin, my Matt, my cousin Matt, you know Matt? Yeah, I know I'm Matt. Yeah, so he um he used to work at Rock when you was working there. He used to deliver all the packages. And I'm like, dope. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> like, Bye. Bye. He's like, you know, but then he's like, then but he, yo, Matt, you, you he tries to do the full circle, like, yo, so me and Matt are trying to start this thing, and like you you guys were cool. So he had told me one time that he shook your hand. Like it's wild. Mm-hmm. They go off into these tangents yeah. of like trying to don't connect yourself to me, bro. Not not that not that I'm above you or whatever. But if you're trying to do something, don't try to bring up a bunch of things that haven't been done because I'm just realizing you're not doing anything with your I know, time. I know. It you almost know? feels like they're literally spraying smokes and mirrors that like that I don't and need. Then, and then you're just like I'd rather yeah. you come up and tell me, "Yo man, I'm a struggling artist. Um I got kicked out of my house." Because I'm trying to do screen printing and my mom is allergic to the smell. Um, you know, do you know of any places that I can screen print? I want to make a brand. Tell me that. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell me, yo, my mom used to work at Home Depot uh, 10 blocks from your house. I don't yeah. care. I'd rather you tell me what you're trying to do, mm-hmm. see if it sparks my interest, and get some advice from me, and then keep that moving. All right, man. I think that's good. Thank yeah. you very much no, for No, of your course, time. man. Thank you and for so doing it. Tell us how we can keep up with your life. At Upscale Vandal, everywhere in life. Right. At Upscale underscore Vandal, UpscaleVandal.com. If you're looking for some consulting work, if you're listening to this and you're one of those companies that I mentioned, or you're looking for some consulting work, go to the website, send my you know, info at Upscale Vandal. We here, man. We trying to shift the culture, trying to be like Jeff Staple in Dubai. Live it. My man. man. Thanks for listening to the episode. You can find out more about the show or listen to past episodes at HypeBeast.com slash radio. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. I use Overcast. And you can reach out to me on Twitter, at Jeff Staple. You can check us out on the web at businessofhype.com. And you can email any questions to questions at businessofhype.com. The Business of Hype is directed by Daniel Novetta, edited and produced by Bright Young Things. You can check them out at byt.nyc. Engineering was done by Patrick Morris. This was recorded at Sibling Rivalry Studio in New York City and on location at Seoul DXB in Dubai. I'm Jeff Staple, and you've been listening to The Business of Hype on Hype Beast Radio.